Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today on this webinar entitled Apache Spark, the New Enterprise Backbone for ETL, Batch Processing, and Real-Time Streaming. My name is Larry Pearson. I'm the Vice President of Marketing for Impetus Technologies, and I'll serve as your host and MC for today's session. Uh, our team of experts today will be sharing insights and best practices from various implementations of Apache Spark for batch streaming analytics uh, uh, use cases, and uh, I hope that you'll get great value from uh, what we're able to share today. Let me take a minute and introduce our speakers. The first speaker will be Anand Venugopal. Anand has uh, been with Impetus for eight years. He heads product strategy for Stream Analytics, which is an open source based uh, enterprise grade streaming analytics platform which was developed by Impetus Technologies. He brings 20 years of uh, software innovation and business development experience in the enterprise and telco space and is particularly passionate about open source based enterprise supported uh, technology solutions. With him is Puneet Shah. Puneet is a senior solution architect with Impetus. Puneet was a key member of the core team that developed uh, Stream Analytics and uh, since then has been directly involved in all of the different POCs and implementations that we've done uh, dating back to the announcement of the product and more recently with uh, its full support on Apache Spark and he'll be sharing some of his experiences about all of that today. Let's quickly take a minute and look at, uh, look at today's agenda. Uh, in spite of uh, many years of investments in data lakes, uh, Hadoop celebrated its 10-year anniversary uh, last year. There's still wide use of uh, traditional and often costly uh, enterprise products for data ingestion, integration, and transformation. Uh, for bringing data onto the data lake, processing on the data lake, etc. And Apache Spark now is an important part of the Hadoop ecosystem, and it can be used as an inex Apache Spark uh, has a position inside of the Hadoop ecosystem today as not just a way to de de handle and develop uh, machine learning and uh, big data analytic use cases, but can also handle the requirements for full lifecycle processing, analytics, and machine work. Uh, machine learning workloads as an inexpensive uh, enterprise backbone, and that's the context that we'll be discussing that today. Uh, Stream Analytics brings a visual framework on top of Apache Spark, which is, addresses one of the uh, inhibitors to Spark, adapt, uh, Spark adoption in the enterprise, and that is the lack of available skills. And so during the session today, we're addressing all of these relevant to both on-premise and cloud-based uh, deployments. Um, before we jump into the uh, material, I'd like to jump into the main uh, content of our webinar today by introducing uh, Anand Venugopal. Anand, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Larry and Pankaj, for hosting this webinar. And uh, it's a pleasure to be joined by <clears throat> my uh, panelists here, Puneet Shah. We're joining you from Los Gatos, California. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening for all the live attendees, and uh, hello to you if you're listening to this as a recording. So uh, Larry set the context entirely very well. Uh, we'll, we'll go right into it. Uh, so I, I lead the stream analytics business here at Impetus, and uh, Puneet and I talk to customers day in and day out. We keep learning, and uh, we make an attempt to share our learnings in these webinars. Uh, Given that it's an interesting topic, uh, you know, we thought we'd make it a little more interesting by making it a role play. So we're going to be communicating our message today using a role play with two personas. My, uh, my character, uh, AV, is a key influencer in the enterprise data ecosystem in a big bank called NextGen Bank. We're obviously going to be referring to, uh, you know, fictional entities like this uh, that might or might not even remind you of uh, real things, but they're not intended to. So, you know, this person is uh, <clears throat> satisfied, currently contented with the current setup of an infrastructure enterprise vendors, uh, has a preference for traditional vendors, you know, nobody gets, nobody gets fired for picking uh, the big ones. So, but he's open to learning about and considering new technologies. <laughs> and uh, my competent partner here, Puneet Shah, who pretty much kind of plays himself, he's an Apache Spark user and believer, 
uh, it does come with a lot of understanding of enterprise needs and legacy products, but at the same time, it's very up to date with uh, Apache Spark and what it can do. And uh, given given a preference, he would rather build stuff and show stuff rather than talk about stuff. So that's the kind of person uh, Puneet is. Okay, so. This is a conversation that's going to be between the two of us, and we're going to be uh, un unfurling the whole webinar um, in, in, in that context. All right, so here you go. <clears throat> Hi, I'm AV. I'm the VP of Enterprise Data Platforms at NextGen Bank. Hey, cool. Good to meet you, AV. My name is Puneet Shah. I just go by Shah to make it easy, you know, like when I'm at Starbucks, for example. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that, Puneet. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll just stick with Puneet. I can say your name pretty well. Um, what is it that makes you seem to be very happy? Glad you noticed, know Davey. I have a feeling you'll be happy, too, when you hear this. I'm a big data solutions architect, and I just finished a project at another major bank where we used Apache Spark to build and deploy a cybersecurity data platform. Wow. Man, that sounds, that sounds pretty huge. Uh, and why do you think that would make me happy, though? Well, uh, let me take a step back and ask you, what is it that you exactly do as a VP of Enterprise Data Platforms? Thanks for checking in with me. And, uh, <clears throat> so anyway, so I actually need the help uh, to evaluate and choose technologies and vendors at uh, NextGen Bank for our end-to-end -end data processing tasks, including ingestion, integration, wrangling, predictive analytics, machine learning, pretty much soup to nuts. Mm -hmm. Okay, that sounds a lot of different things under your charge there, Avi. Yes, Puneet, it can get pretty crazy at times. Yeah, so tell me, how many vendor products make up this whole mix of yours? Well, hold on, you're asking me questions here. Weren't you supposed to tell me about your bank project with Apache Spark? I hear about it all the time these days. I'm sure Spark is really hot right now. But before I come to that, uh, please tell me, how many vendors do you have under this umbrella? Uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, six. I think a total of six vendors. So we got uh, all of these vendors that uh, I'm showcasing on the screen today, Medica, Big Data Edition, Allen, Factor, Rackle Screen, Source Analytics, Rackle, Big Data Appliance. Um, as you can see, we got the best of breed enterprise vendors lined up. They're all jointly going to take us into the new era of data processing. Wow. Really? Six vendors just in your department alone. Are you aware that there are other products being used in other departments as well? Well, unfortunately, you're right. There are different vendor products in other departments as well. And I'm sure a lot of them would be doing the same tasks. In many cases, yes. Mm -hmm. So tell me, uh, how long did all of this take for you to build up? You know, it's a, it's a complicated process, right? So it took about three years and a few million dollars um, to put together the whole architecture blueprint for this whole stack, uh, project planning, POCs, finally getting it into a stable production state. Yeah, three years and a few million, man. We're, we're all set to go. Wow. Three years and a few millions, huh? Uh, why was it that complex? Well, Puneet, you should know, right? I mean, you, you, you claim to have a lot of enterprise experience. <laughs> uh, we're not alone in this. They, you know, nothing, nothing very special. I think uh, anywhere you have such a large multi-vendor system integration situation, there are unplanned scenarios that end up taking time. And, you know, so here we are. Sure, yeah, I understand. Uh, but tell me, what are your big data plans? Uh, on big data, we have a roadmap to move to uh, the Rackle uh, appliance, which has Hadoop built in. Nice. So, as you can see, uh, Puneet, we're you know all set here. That's why they call us Next Gen Bank. You know, we're always on. We got 24 by 7 operation. Nothing can go down. And these these vendors and technologies have stood the test of time over many decades. This is no open source game. Yeah. But not so fast, Avi. You haven't heard from me yet. Remember, I was going to tell you something about my project. Okay, go ahead. I'm all ears. Yeah, sure. But uh, sorry, just one more quick question before that. Okay, if you must. But this is the last one, okay? <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. But thanks, thanks for your patience and understanding. Uh, the question is, 
Besides reliability and always on, what are your other challenges or requirements? For example, what is the business expecting from you? That's uh, that's a good question. I, I must say you're beginning to make me uh, think twice about you, um, So let me actually address that, okay? So besides reliability and um, always on, a lot of my challenges are the big and growing expectations that business has from us, from the, from the data platform folks, right? We're expected to integrate all the data silos. We're supposed to give a single source of truth. We're supposed to provide this ubiquitous self-service access. And, you know, there's a long list of uh, use cases in the roadmap that, that, are, that are, you know, that we're expected to deliver. Okay, I get it. So the data platform is the basis for a lot of your future innovations and growth in the company, right? So, in fact, all the more of a reason why I think a single technology for all these data processing needs may be something you would be interested in. A single technology for all the data processing? Uh, I'm not sure what you're getting at, Puneet. Please elaborate. Sure. Um, first of all, let me thank you by uh, let me thank you for sharing this entire situation of yours with me. Uh, I know a lot of these uh, products and vendors that you referred to, uh, many of them are really good products as well. And I do understand that the demands and complexity of an enterprise, um, you would be considering these as an option. But also you did mention that you were skeptical about open source. Uh, let me tell you something from my experience. Open source systems these days are being widely accepted and deployed across many enterprises, believe me. Specifically with regard to Apache Spark, oh, you wouldn't believe. Each and every one of our Fortune 100 or 500 customers are using it and using it in production. Moreover, Spark is such a versatile technology, it does so many things at the same time. So the big thing that I wanted to tell you, remember? Are you ready? Yes, I've been ready, and you've been dangling that carrot for a long time. <laughs> okay, so here it goes. You may not need this big data multi-vendor scenario that you currently have, if you can leverage all the benefits of Apache Spark. Wow, okay, so I may not need this multi-vendor scenario if I leverage Apache Spark. That's a bit of a radical statement. These guys have been around for a long time, and I'm not the only enterprise executive that's using all of these. What, what do you mean? Tell me, Tell me more. Yeah, see, I told you you'd be interested. Okay, Puneet, cut to the chase, man. Give me an overview of the technology itself and its enterprise readiness, okay? That's what I want to hear. Okay, sure. Okay, so let's get to it. So, Spark, it's basically a distributed in-memory compute platform which was originally open sourced in 2010. Uh, it was created to uh, come up with a better performance on MapReduce jobs that were traditionally being written in Hadoop. So. Performance tests and benchmarks actually claim that Spark was 30 times faster than what MapReduce jobs used to do. And that's how it gained its popularity. People started replacing a lot of their MapReduce jobs with Apache Spark. And as that popularity and demand kept growing, the community supporting that entire project also increased tremendously. And if you look at the state today where Spark is, you'd be surprised. It supports a high-speed batch, workflows, it supports graph databases, it supports streaming applications um, in a micro-batch paradigm. The next version of Spark, which has already been announced and it's now available, 2.3, it also supports continuous querying, so it's no longer just micro-batch. Uh, and what's also interesting is it allows, uh, it's iterative and interactive development, allows the data scientists to like really uh, scan through the data, play with it, do feature extraction, feature transformation, all in kind of a interactive, near real-time fashion where they can look at this huge chunks of data sitting inside their big data lake, run their models, train their models on large data sets which they weren't able to do previously. And the best part is Spark, you can run this on-premise and as on cloud as well. Wow, man, that's, that's a handful. You just loaded me up with a lot of information there. I'd actually heard about all this, you know, this hype about Spark. Uh, honestly, I didn't know it could do graph, for example. I mean, uh, but I still don't hear one of my biggest, uh, you know, concerns addressed. What about enterprise readiness? I mean, this can all be great for, you know, a big lab or maybe Yahoo or Google and LinkedIn, but uh, we're a bank, okay? So 
Tell me about enterprise readiness. Sure, I think that's a fair question. Um, I hear it all the time whenever I'm speaking to any enterprise. So let me tell you something about um, the enterprise readiness for Spark. So it's a fault-tolerant engine. It supports an exactly one semantics, which especially in banks and financial institutions, they really care about. It supports back pressure, dynamic scaling, so you can handle different workloads during your peak hours and off-peak hours with uh, better cluster resource utilization. Uh, it's very performant. Like I said, originally when it came in, it proved itself to be like 30 times faster. Um, the throughput, again, is elastic. So, well, all of these put together really make it a compelling offering that enterprises are now adopting and really deploying it all the way up to production. Wow. Uh, give me one more, a little bit on the fault tolerant piece, because that's one of the most important things for me, right? Well, what do you mean by that? Sure. So, uh, usually you want your applications to be always on, always running. Uh, you don't want any kind of uh, hardware failures to really interrupt your processing. Uh, so, fault tolerance actually allows you to do um, run your workflows or jobs in a continuous fashion 24 cross 7. Even if there's a node failure, you can still go ahead and uh, Spark will take care of deploying the tasks that were scheduled on that node on any other node that's available without really impacting the availability of your job. That's why uh, it's fault tolerant. Subsequently, the driver program in Spark, again, you can run that in a supervised fashion. If it crashes for whatever reason, uh, it can also spin off again on some other node in the cluster. So all of these features together make it really fault tolerant uh, and reliable. This tech deep dive is, is good. Um, thank you. And uh, what I'm really interested in, however, is your practical experience of running it in, in large enterprises, right? So uh, have you really done this in, in, in large enterprises? Yes, and I, I can share some of the stories where I was personally involved in certain implementations. Um, for example, I just did a cybersecurity uh, use case for a major U.S. bank. Uh, it was a very small cluster. It was a four-node cluster, and again, this cluster was not just Spark alone. We had a bunch of other uh, big data technologies deployed on the same nodes, yet we were able to scale up to ingesting 200 million records per day, doing all sorts of complex event processing as part of it. And again, uh, let me remind you, this is a cybersecurity pipeline or a job that we are talking about. So it has to be always on. So the resiliency and the fault tolerance of Spark was obviously tested. It went through all the tests, and it came out with flying colors. And the bank actually took it into production. They had no issues with that. The security team within the bank also passed the software. Uh, some other examples in a major U.S. airline, uh, a three-node cluster, we are ingesting four terabytes worth of data every single day. This data is being indexed and is available for rapid querying in near real time, which earlier was not possible by the business. Um, in another tier one US telco, again, four nodes of Spark cluster ingesting 100 million records per day, solving the con uh, contact center analytics uh, solution uh, problem statement. So yeah, it, it's, it's pretty wide, and there are several more in all different industries. This is just the first three that I most recently worked on. with uh, nodes in the ranges of like 50s and 100s, all stable, running in production, no issues at all. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you brought up that last point, you know, because I was beginning to wonder, I mean, is Spark uh, pretty much limited to three, four, five node deployments? I mean, you, uh, <laughs> uh, at least the folklore is that people like, you know, uh, you know, like I said, all the social media giants have 1,000 plus nodes and of these running, right? I, yes, yes. Have you and, and, really seen that in enterprises? I have, I have. So uh, the tier one telco, for example, they have like 250 plus node clusters that I have worked on directly. Um, and it's completely stable. Uh, and that's the reason why everybody's in fact adopting. That's, that's the uh, proof right there. You know, Puneet, you started with a bold hypothesis that I could get rid of a lot of my current vendors with uh, with this, I've still not heard. I mean, I, this is an overall good start in terms of what you made in terms of how Spark can fit into the enterprise, right? Tell me about the the details, right? So my challenges in this in this slide here, right, uh, is that for a data platform, we need to ingest batch and streaming sources. We need to do data quality. We need to do transformations. 
blending, enrichment, right? Analytics, machine learning, loading different target stores. We got to provide data access and governance over the whole thing. Where is all this functionality? Is this, is this all covered in Spark? I mean, the vendor ecosystem from the, that feed that, that supplies enterprises today has all of this covered. That's why we buy all of these products. Yes, absolutely, sure. Uh, and that's exactly my point. We created the name Data360 for the full journey from ingest to visualization, and Spark has APIs and functionality that cover all of it. Let me give you a quick tour of that. Okay. So what do you do on the ingest side, for example? So, again, what you're seeing here is just a handful of uh, popular connectors in the big data ecosystem. So, for example, if you need to read data from HDFS file system or S3, Hive table, any RDBMS databases, uh, you have connectors to that. You have connectors to a lot of uh, streaming sources. Um, and the Spark community has also evolved and grown over the period of time. They are now contributing to the community um, for packages and connectors to a large range of other technologies like in-memory distributed caching systems like Redis, uh, in-memory uh, in databases. So you have connectors to pretty much all your big data technologies with Spark. Hmm. So, can you, can you run me through the whole uh, flow, right? What does Spark provide for, for example, for cleansing and data? You mentioned data quality. I didn't know we got data quality operators in, in Spark. Is it really there? Uh, there are. There are quite a few data quality or uh, cleansing operators in Spark, which we, which you can readily use out of the box. So, if you want to, for example, uh, filter the data that's coming in with, with certain um, bad values or values that you really do not want to push forward in your workflow, you can reject those. Uh, if you want to do any kind of deduplication, you can do that. If you want to do uh, any kind of uh, very simple, uh, straightforward checks of data quality, like is this a number, is this a string which is not null, what is the basic uh, length of the string, is this a valid email ID, uh, is this a valid social security number format that the data is coming in, and so forth. So there are a bunch of those different kinds of APIs that you can really use out of the box to get your job done. You know, often I need to blend streams, uh, streams with uh, batch data, all of that, right? So what functionality do you have for blending? Uh, depending on what your uh, workflow or task is, so if you have streaming job and you want to blend your streaming data that's coming in with data at rest, you have APIs and you have connectors to do that. Uh, very recently, in fact, with Spark 2.3, uh, stream and stream joins are also now available. Um, if, if you are in the IoT space in particular, you'll realize and appreciate uh, this particular feature. Um, if, if you're familiar with the whole late arrival of events where especially it's a problem with streaming uh, jobs is you can never predict if the data is always going to arrive in time because your upstream systems, when they are pushing the data to Spark, there is a likelihood of uh, any kind of network uh, connections breaking down. You may receive the data much later than you anticipate. So how do you handle those kind of joins and stuff like that for your aggregations and stateful processing as well? So this has always been a challenge in uh, streaming jobs with Spark 2.3. They have resolved that. Um, they allow support joining of stream to streams. They support uh, recalculation or updation of calculations of your aggregations and states uh, through the feature of watermarking. So that's a pretty interesting feature that they introduced uh, in 2.3. One, and onwards with watermarking and the latest release also supporting stream to stream joining. Uh, if you're doing your batch workflows, then you also can join multiple batch uh, data sources together to really enrich your information. So there are a whole lot of different scenarios in which you can leverage uh, Spark APIs to really enrich and blend your data. Wow, you know, somebody told me, Puneet, that that you like to build and show things in reality rather than just talk about it. You seem to be a pretty good talker, too. Are you going to show me some <laughs> some, some real stuff as well soon? I'm, I'm hoping that you'll come into that sometime soon, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm all excited to show you what I have today. Wow. Okay, good. So let, let me ask you a couple of quick questions before that. Okay, so what about transformation? You know, the people are using transformation and ETL vendors all over the place. I'm using, as I showed you, you know, two or three big ones. Uh, what have you got for transformations so that in spark right sure and in spark the transformation functions are huge meaning the list just keeps going on there are core api based functions which are probably more than 150 plus then you have 
SQL based functions. Um, again, the support of SQL in Spark is a, a tremendous powerful feature that not just developers appreciate, but even uh, business analysts appreciate because SQL is a language that a lot of people can connect to and write. So there are a lot of, again, 100 plus SQL functions that people can um, use. Apart from that, you can also create your own user-defined functions, register those, and execute on Spark in a distributed parallel computing fashion. So, hmm. interesting. <laughs> so, um, finally, right, uh, we got to serve a lot of data scientists. They they do a lot of you know feature-related work on the on the data science features, and they do a lot of ML work. I know Spark is very strong in ML. Uh, tell me a little bit about that. Sure. So uh, in analytics, Spark has different kinds of operations and operators available. So if you want to do as a data scientist uh, feature extraction, uh, you have a whole library for that. If you want to do feature transformation, uh, you have a complete library of like 30 plus different feature transformations available, feature selection, uh, machine learning models in different categories like classifications, regression, random forest, um, to name a few. Uh, even third party vendors like H2 have their integrations for Spark, so you can even run uh, H2 models on top of Spark as well. Hmm. Uh, finally, I am sure you, you got a lot of APIs for loading different databases. I can see that in your slide here, so thank you. Uh, you know, what occurs to me, Puneet, then when I hear all of this is that, yeah, you got a lot of APIs, right? Let me tell you my problem with this. There's, for enterprise grade uh, systems, like we can't do a lot of hand coding. I mean, how much hand coding will we do? Uh, I can't train people. This seems like rocket science to me, honestly. I, I'm not that, that technical, but even, you know, I'm not sure about hiring this many people that know this deep enough with all these APIs and you know doing prototype poc applications and production grade stuff that keeps on 24 by 7 in the bank is very different so you know i'm hoping you have some answers for me in terms of how do i make this truly enterprise uh, friendly i mean if you tell me that that um, i got to hire a bunch of 50 spark engineers i yeah, i don't think everybody can do that no you you're absolutely right a part of spark uh, done manually uh, would require certain kind of skill set and expertise, and you may not have them, you may need to go look for that kind of uh, skill set, hire a large bunch of uh, group of people to do that for you. And that's why um, I can also recommend the visual ID tool, like Stream Analytics, to make the power of Spark come alive and that too easily. So uh, let me take you through a demo of that tool and show you all that we have spoken about just now. Okay, sounds good. I'm eager to see it. I'm hoping you're gonna cover everything we talked about, right? The whole ingest ETL, uh, we're doing a lot of cloud stuff. I wanna see whether you got on-prem, on cloud. You gotta show me all that, right? Sure. Uh, as part of the demo, I have two different pipelines. Uh, one is for the it's a Spark ETL process and the other is for an IoT, uh, connected car use case. Uh, one of them is hosted on cloud and the other is hosted on-premise, just to showcase that yes, you can run Spark and Stream Analytics on cloud and on-premise as well, and actually even in a hybrid situation. Uh, what you're seeing here is the web UI of uh, Stream Analytics product. I'm, I'm particularly, I'm on the data pipeline page. So this is where you start building your Spark workflows, maybe streaming or batch. <clears throat> Every tile on this page is actually representing a Spark workflow. It could be a batch workflow or a streaming workflow. Uh, for this particular example, I've in, I'm ingesting Nest thermostat data, so I have Nest installed at home. I just uh, wrote an API to fetch all the Nest info, thermostat information and started publishing it to Kafka. So let's just take a look at that uh, pipeline right here, what that pipeline is really doing. So you're answering my question about this, is this, so this whole tool is a, is, is a Spark workflow creation tool, right? That's right. So the question you asked earlier that, hey, I, I, this is all great, but how do we do this? Do I need to go out and look for uh, about 50 odd developers who can get my job done, or is there any other way to do this? So Stream Analytics is the answer to that. It's a visual ID tool. It helps you build your Spark applications in a drag drop fashion by dropping all these different operators onto a canvas. You connect them, configure them. 
and you simply deploy them to a hosting Spark cluster. Okay. So uh, what we are seeing here is um, the sample pipeline that I created. I'm reading data from Kafka. So if you look here on the right side first, you have channels. These are all the different operators uh, from where you can read data. And again, the platform itself is pretty extensible. If you do not find a source or an operator here that you need, you can go ahead and write your own and register it with the platform and it becomes available. Uh, once you drag any source that you're interested in, simply click. You see this configuration option. You select what schema of message you are interested in, what Kafka cluster in this particular case you want to connect to, what's the name of the Kafka topic you're reading the data from, what is its partition, et cetera. So, Literally, in a matter of seconds, you are now ready to ingest data from Kafka. The next operator that I have configured is the data quality operator. Um, if I right-click on it, we can see uh, this view here on which on the left side, we see all the different attributes of the incoming message. So all, these are all the different kinds of attributes or the payload uh, that I'm receiving from Nest. On the right side, in this panel here, we see different kinds of functions, uh, your data quality functions. So, for example, depending on the attribute that you choose, uh, appropriate functions are uh, available. Temperature being um, decimal or a number, you get related operations or functions here, like is it a valid decimal number? Is it greater than a particular threshold? Is it less than? Is it null? Is it in between a range? So you can select any one of these, and you create your entire uh, data quality workflow or logic out here, and you also have the choice to choose an action. So for example, if the temp if any record that comes in does not meet this criteria, what would you like to do with that record? Would you like to discard or ignore that record? Would you like to assign a default value to that record? Or would you like to send it to an error queue so that you can um, notify the upstream system that, hey, the data format that you're sending, in certain cases, it's not adhering to the schema that was uh, signed up. Can I reject? data that doesn't uh, follow the rules? Yes. So the discard operator or the action allows you to simply reject and ignore those. Ah, uh, okay. Right. Here's another example. This one's a string uh, of data type string. So you see string related functions out here. Um, you can do matching with regular expressions. You can see whether it has a particular minimum length, uh, whether it begins or starts with a particular prefix, ends with a particular suffix, so on and so forth. So you can actually drag all your different data quality rules, checks and balances out here, define what action you would like to take in case um, any one of these rules do not get met. Now, once you've got your data coming in, it's gone through the data quality check. Before you go there, just one more. You, you showed Kafka, but you're able to ingest data from bad sources, from other real-time sources, and all of that, right? Yes. So depending on what application you're building, whether it's a streaming or a batch application, you'll see different operations and operators out here in this palette. That's what you call channels? No, that's what we call channels. Uh -huh. So first, you select whether you want to build a streaming or a batch <laughs> workflow, and depending on that, appropriate operators become available. Okay, sorry for interrupting you. Go ahead with your flow. So once you've got your data quality checks done, next is the SQL processor that I was talking about. So in this particular example, I'm just uh, getting the streaming data in, and I'm using device details, a table which is sitting inside of Hadoop. I'm merging the two of them. So it's basically an example of the streaming data coming in and being joined with data at rest. So I'm writing a query which is joining the streaming data on the device ID with a table which contains more information about that particular device, like who's, what's the serial number, what's the location where this device is, so on and so forth. So I can get all that additional information and enrich my incoming information with all of this right here by simply writing a SQL query. So again, the focus as a developer building a Spark use case is to focus on my business logic rather than worrying about the underlying Spark APIs. Uh, next in the pipeline is a Python operator. So. Uh, over, over a period of time with all enterprises that we have interacted with, we have realized that in data science, Python is one of the most common um, scripting languages that data scientists prefer because of its uh, rich library supporting machine learning. So we have a Python operator where you can simply, literally, in other words, copy paste your entire Python script. So let's say you have a data scientist in your organization who has um, 
identified a model, did a small POC with a small set of data, wrote a Python script, uh, and is pretty confident that this is the model he wants to take it and run it on a much larger data set and test it out. Literally, you can simply copy paste your Python script here in this Python operator and simply save it. If you have any other uh, dependencies or external packages that you need, you can install those and provide references to those. So, for example, in this particular case, we are referring to NumPy and Scikit-learn. These are two different uh, packages in Python, which uh, this particular script is using. So it's using a regression model, which was previously trained and available, and we are using that trained model to now predict the data that's coming in. So we get temperature coming in, and it's going to look for anomalies in the temperature values. So, so Puneet, you, you know, you're talking about putting code here. How do I debug? I mean, how do I know that my stuff is working well, uh, my logic is, you know, is there, you got something there? You may, you may or may not need to show me, but. The... Sure, yeah, no, uh, I, I will come to that in the next part of the demo uh, where you have the ability to also debug your application. So this is pretty much the design phase. We also support uh, interactive development and design where you can literally see your logic uh, being applied on a sample set of data right here and see how it impacts your data. Instant, so, like, like instant, uh, literally in matters of like 10 milliseconds or so, you'll see a response. Are you going to show me that? Yeah, I do. Okay. Now, um, quickly skimming through the rest of the pipeline, once you figure out the anomalies using this Python based model, if you want to do any kind of alerting, we have an alert module for that. Uh, streaming emitter module to stream out anomalous events onto a real-time graph. So many times you may be interested in uh, seeing real-time visualizations when something goes wrong, you need a counter to be updated somewhere or a graph to be showing a blip on it on a line saying, hey, this is an anomalous transaction or an event that has come in. Uh, so you can do all of that using uh, streaming emitter. We support HTML5 based web sockets for the same. Uh, now, here, here's the interesting part, right? This is where you go ahead and you design and develop your pipeline. But subsequently, uh, in enterprises, that's just one part of the puzzle. The other part of the puzzle is what happens when I deploy this pipeline or this job on a big, large cluster in production? Is it doing well? Are there any errors? Uh, what's the throughput rate am I getting? How close I am to the actual source in terms of processing. Is my source much faster in sending data, but I'm processing at a smaller, uh, at a lesser rate? Uh, so all that kind of insights, the monitoring insights as we call them, uh, you can get all of those using the uh, monitoring capabilities of the tool. So right here, what we are seeing is um, monitoring graphs. I'll first just scroll through to, uh, so that you get a sense of all the different kinds of monitoring graphs that we capture and record. Uh, so you can actually see that as data keeps flowing by, you can see what's your processing time for your every micro batch superimposed with the number of events that it's processing. So you get a very good view of as my number of events in a batch goes up, does my processing time spike? And if it does, by what percentage? Is it significant or is it something still tolerable within the limit so that I don't really have to worry about any kind of backlog being generated? Uh, subsequently, on the graph on the right side, you see how many batches per minute are you processing. Uh, the system actually keeps monitoring this graph in case if the number of batches goes be below this reference line or falls to zero, it's going to proactively raise alerts so that the operations team can in instantly look at it. So the beauty of the platform is that it proactively monitors these metrics and alerts when something uh, when sometimes things go wrong. You don't need an operations guy continuously staring at the screen to see what's really happening. So this is not for developers, this is for DevOps and operations teams, and they can they can watch for, is it, can a developer watch his pipeline as well and see what, how it's doing and? Uh, yes, so we, we, ha we do support different roles and access controls, so depending on what your role is, whether you are an uh, operations person or a developer with operations rights, you can look all of these in production. Um, a developer alone, for example, in production doesn't have the right to start, stop a pipeline. You can just look at these statistics. Only the operations guy has the ability to start or stop since it's production, but in dev environment, there's more control given to the developer and so forth. So there's a complete uh, role-based access control uh, built into the platform. Now, if I keep scrolling down, we see different kinds of uh, views here. Uh, 
I'll just keep scrolling pretty quick. Uh, we also have a profiling view. So uh, this is something that the developers uh, would be interested in, especially if now the pipeline is in production. You had tested it out on your uh, staging environment. You did a benchmark, all looked good. You deployed in production, but now suddenly after three days of running in production, the pipeline is becoming slow. There are backlogs accumulating. How do you debug what really is happening? Are there leaks in the program, in the logic, or is it just because the cluster utilization suddenly has gone up since it's a shared resource? So how do you start debugging? So the profiling helps you. For example, this is a view where you have a batch of 10 seconds. So for this particular pipeline, it's, uh, on an average, over the last 10 minutes, Kafka has taken about a second to read the data. The data quality has taken about a second. Within data quality, we have those temperature and weather, those two attributes, if oh, you remember. Inside that so it actually good. gives you a much um, fine-grained view as to individual attribute level checks as well, then the SQL and so forth. So if there are certain recommendations during the profiling that the system can figure out, it would also provide you recommendations. So for example, it says in this particular case, if you repartition your data, remember um, the Kafka topic was at an initial partition of four. So it actually says if you re, if you either can increase your Kafka partitions and if that would be great. If not, if you repartition this data, you can even get better throughput than what you are actually getting. And similarly, other Spark internal configuration recommendations also the system can emit. Is this for real, Buneet? I mean, a lot of people would love this. I'm sure, and that's the reason uh, we got this in when we started working with enterprises and deployment of these tools. This was one of their actual pain points where they said, hey, this is great. You gave me gave me a canvas. It really made my the developer's life easy. Uh, they were able to very quickly turn around use cases. But now the second part of the problem is, how do I uh, really tune my application? Hmm. Because building is a one-time activity, but tuning is something that you do in an iterative fashion to get the best throughput possible. So any kind of recommendations where the system can actually provide would be like really useful. So that's how we actually got that entire um, feedback from enterprises early on and we built into the platform. Wow. You want to show me that visual notebook thing? Yeah, sure. Let me just switch some browsers here. Let's go here. This is another connected car uh, use case pipeline that I was referring to in the IoT space. So we are reading data from AWS IoT right here. I can just click on this I icon. Uh, what it's doing behind the scenes is it's fetching a sample of records from the AWS IoT connector and showcasing it to me right here. So if you see, it's a pretty hefty payload. It's a nested JSON uh, with arrays and stuff. So if you look at the payload, it's like pretty big, pretty complex in terms of the levels it goes into and arrays and stuff like that. Okay. So the system is automatically able to detect that schema. You don't have to upfront define that schema of the pretty nasty JSON structure of how it's going to be. When you click on the eye, what had exactly happened? So when you clicked on the eye, what happened was it actually went ahead, read a sample of data from the AWS IoT in this particular case or whatever your source is. It's going to detect that schema and show it out to you. One batch? Uh, one batch, yes. Okay. Uh, but however, there is a limit that you uh, keep. So even if you have, let's say, 20,000 events, uh, since you're bringing it on the UI and you want to humanly uh, interact and play with it, we just limit it to a maximum of 100 messages. Okay. Now, next is a SQL query. So let's say you got your data coming in. You wrote this uh, query. This query could be pretty much anything. Uh, you write your query. You hit next. Yeah, you can immediately see that the sample data that you read from AWS IoT, when that query got applied on that sample data set, this is how your data transformation happened. This is after the first operator, or the second operator, is it? Yes. Yeah, so this is the output of the SQL query being applied on that input data set. Okay. Right. So you simply go next, save, and you see it right here. You can start drilling down. The next is aggregation operator. <laughs> In aggregation, um, earlier I spoke about watermarking, especially for late arrival of events. How do you handle that? So this is an example for that, where you get your data coming in. If a data comes up much later than its uh, anticipated time, uh, which is basically a late arrival event, you can still support it, you can still recompute your aggregations, your stateful um, calculations, as long as the late arrival window is within the watermarking duration out here, so which is three minutes in this case. So what, in other words, what I'm saying here on this UI is, if any event arrives, 
within the three minutes of its generation, I'll be able to still consider it for all its um, aggregations and stateful calculations. If it arrives beyond three minutes, I'll simply ignore or discard it. At three minutes, again, is an example here. Uh, you could take this to much longer periods, like one day, a uh, couple of hours, 10 hours, 12 hours. It all depends on the size of the cluster you're working with and also what the use case demands. Uh, I, I think I read about event time. That, that's what this, this is all this about. This is what event time is, yes. yes. Uh, which is part of the whole structured streaming with Spark 2 that came up. <clears throat> so this is, again, what I call as a visual interaction, uh, a visually interactive development using the tool. Uh, you can pretty much drag drop any such operators from this palette here and start uh, playing with it. So what do you think, Avi? Uh, do, you, do you think this tool makes it easy for you to have developers build your Spark applications rapidly? You're beginning to really, really convince me, um, Puneet. I mean, this is, this is uh, I, I'm getting some hope now. You talk to me about enterprise uh, readiness, you talk to me about performance, um, you talk to me about scalability, you talked about uh, the UI for Spark. So effectively, what you're telling me is I can actually do my complete ingestion, cleansing, blending, transformation, analytics, machine learning. Did you have machine learning in there in one of your flows? We did. Remember, um, um, I used the Python operator to showcase a regression model written in Python, but apart from that, the tool also has the entire Spark machine learning libraries inside it, which you can visually drag drop and start using on the canvas. Mm. Can, I, uh, can I get this product? I mean, is there a free version or something? Yeah, absolutely. If, if you go and visit streamanalytics.com, uh, you can download uh, this product there, there is a free version which you can install pretty much on your laptop or your uh, computer uh, and try it out for sure. Wow. Okay. Well, so um, I'm, I'm hoping the, the attendees uh, were able to really get value from, from this conversation. Um, you know, I'm and ending the, the mock role play here. Thank you for putting up with us. It was just a quirky idea we thought will, will be interesting. Uh, what we really are looking to show is how Spark is very, very powerful to replace all of that stack of vendors that you might have, and how there is, there is really a way to make Spark easy. And some of you are you know, giving us a lot of good positive feedback about uh, about how this was uh, useful for you. Can you please ensure, uh, you know, Larry, if you want to encourage the participants to complete the poll and, and uh, announce it? Absolutely. Thank you, Anand. You'll, you'll see here on this slide a recap of some of the major points that were made. Uh, you will see a poll appearing here in, your, in that poll panel here in a minute. We'll ask you to uh, respond to that. The first poll question is, do you agree that Apache Spark is a strong candidate to be the enterprise data processing backbone, as we've described here? A binary uh, set of answers there. And would you be interested in a deeper dive of Stream Analytics, a visual platform for Apache Spark, as shown in this, uh, in this webinar? And lastly, but very important to us, please rate your overall experience with the webinar today of five being the highest, and it's very important to us to have your feedback on that. As we said when we opened the webinar originally, we, you were encouraged to send uh, questions in. We have some time set aside now to answer those questions. So if you do have uh, more questions coming in, uh, we'd be happy to add those uh, into the mix, and we'll take those one by one. Uh, Anand and Puneet, let me read the question, and between the two of you, you can decide who would like to jump in and provide that answer. Uh, the first one says, in your experience, do groups responsible for big data within large, enterprise, uh, large enterprises handcraft Spark code, or are they more reliant on tools like ETL tools to model the ETL ELT and then generate Spark code, Spark code from that? And uh, if the latter, any recommendations on best ways to do that? Uh, and not sure between the two of you who would like to step up and take that one. 
Uh, no, I, I can take that, Larry. Thank you uh, for relaying the question. We do see a lot of folks using manual approach to Spark. You know, I, I've known people, a uh, large uh, security company, for example, that has uh, plenty of Spark SQL, I mean, you know, um, Spark SQL uh, and uh, scoop and, and pretty much a lot of manual work. We, we are seeing a lot of people doing um, manual spark work and one of the reasons why we exist is to make that easy. And uh, there are other tools, but honestly we think that this that what we just demonstrated today is actually the best visual platform for Apache Spark there is in the world today in terms of functionality, in terms of user friendliness, et cetera. There are tools that generate Spark code, like the person asked in the in the in the question. Uh, this tool does not generate code in the back. It, all of the visual operators you saw are actually pre-coded, pre-built. They're all loaded up into the Spark uh, server first, and what the user does is basically build the build the flow as we showed you. And then the configuration is just basically pushed over to uh, pushed over to the Spark server, and then uh, it, it it gets into the Spark cluster. Um, there's you know there's there's different approaches uh, that people do, but we have taken a direct approach. So what you will see here is direct Spark APIs being manifested in our in our UI. Plus the whole, for example, you talked that we talked about the data quality operator. There is no such thing in Apache Spark. Um, we have put together underlying APIs and put together a UI to do complete data quality uh, configuration and rules, et cetera, on top of Apache Spark. They all get manifested as Apache Spark APIs underneath. And that's one of the other questions that uh, I'm trying to address here, right? There, people are asking, uh, hey, is this, is this using Spark APIs in the background? The answer is yes. Yes. Back to you, Larry. A uh, few of the other questions here, do you work with R or big R, and does the IDE support data discovery, data lineage, data asset uh, publication? Maybe combine both of those and address those. Yes. Um, so, why don't, Puneet, why don't you go ahead and uh, pick up on that? I think there's there's some right now, there's some in the roadmap. Uh, go ahead, Puneet. Sure. Yeah, uh, we do uh, data discovery uh, to quite an extent. Um, like, like you saw in the in the connected car demo, we automatically tried detecting the schema uh, from the incoming data that's coming in. We'll attempt to come up with what best fit schema that is and also ask the user to confirm that, hey, this is what we believe the schema to be, and the user has always the ability to override it. From a data lineage perspective, we do have our um, lineage capability. It's two folds. Uh, we integrate lineage with um, the likes of At Apache Atlas or Cloudera Navigator, if that's what you're using in your enterprise, we integrate with those so you can see the full enterprise-wide lineage inside of those tools. And in case if you are not using any of those tools, we do have a lineage of our own as well, uh, which is specific only to the jobs created in Stream Analytics. Great, thank you. So, Larry, we can. That, uh, I hope that addresses. We, we can the see the, we can see the questions as panelists, Larry. If you don't mind, uh, absolutely. We'll pick up Go on some it. of those. Sure. Okay. So we have a question here. During de development and debugging with sample data, do you still expect to deploy the pipeline to the to the cluster, or will it run natively on the product hosting server? Uh, we are flexible. Uh, we let you decide as part of your deployment strategy what you would like to do. We can. Um, by default, we run natively on the product hosting server itself, but instead, if you would like to choose to run that uh, debugging capabilities on the cluster, you could do that as well. Uh, one of the key factors to determine that also would be depending on how, what's your production, uh, the product hosting server's uh, hardware, and how many concurrent users would be using that. So based on some of those aspects, we could even recommend what's the best route there. What's our support for R, Puneet? Uh, so currently, all models that you may have written in R, you can export those as PMML. Uh, we support PMML-based uh, algorithms execution on Spark. So if you have algorithms written in R, you can export those as a PMML format and then uh, just bring them in, into Streamantics and we'll make it Spark compatible and run it on the Spark cluster. 
Got it. And there's an important question about, is this tool open source just like Apache Spark? We, uh, a lot of people wish it was. It's, it's not. Sometimes we've, we've toyed with the idea a lot. Uh, it's not. It is a, it is a licensed uh, product. So you get to, enterprises get to leverage the power of the open source ecosystem underneath. But the tool that adds productivity to that is, uh, is really our, our IP and proprietary at this time. And we've, what we've made available is a free version of the tool that can run on one, one node. So you can actually choose a big fat 24 node server, for example, and load it up with uh, what we call Visual Spark Studio. We're actually renaming it to Stream Analytics Lite as we speak. You can actually go to Visual Spark Studio, one word, dot com, Visual Spark Studio dot com, and uh, you'll see the brief on this product and you can download it. Uh, and, and start playing with it, start building Spark pipelines within minutes. Literally within seven minutes, you'll be up and running on a Spark pipeline on your desktop. That's how powerful that, that visual, uh, the, the tool is. That's basically a one-node version of Stream Analytics that we offer for free. Excellent. Anand, we probably have time just for one more. If you'd take one last one, and then we'll close. And I have other questions here. There have been a lot of interesting questions that come in, and we will get those out to you in the form of an, an email. But uh, why don't you take one more live, and then we'll close. Does the tool cache data in memory? Um, yes, we do in, ma in many cases. For example, if you're doing a lookup, uh, from a from a table, we will will not go look up that table again and again. If it's the same, if it's the same query, we'll we'll cache it in memory. In the case you want to maintain state uh, in applications, uh, we could we could use Spark itself to keep state. We could use something like Redis or uh, Couchbase to keep state, uh, and there, thereby use a big distributed cache as well. If you want to do large time windows at at scale, uh, this this system is provisioned to do all of that. Excellent. Well, listen, I want to thank all of our uh, listeners today. Uh, hopefully you got great value from what you, you saw today. If you do plan to attend Spark Summit or DataWorks Summit, both of them coming up here in June, we'd love to meet you face-to-face. -face. Uh, we will be exhibiting at both of those. If you have not answered the third, in particular, the third poll questions where we ask you to rate your overall experience with the webinar today, five being the highest, we would love for you to do that. If you have other, way, other questions which you have or, or reasons to want to continue the conversation with us, you can reach us, inquiry at streamanalytics.com. I thank you all for your time today. I hope you have a great balance of your day, and thank you for attending. Thank you all.